The Lord be with you. <laughs> Welcome to this service for the third Sunday after Easter. We are in the great 50 days. Woohoo! Great 50 days is the days between Easter and Pentecost. If you're here worshiping with us for the first time or second or third, and if you have not yet filled out a little welcome card, those are in the pews. I'm Reverend Marty Swords Harrell, and welcome to all on Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, however, live streaming. And welcome to you, each one of you. If you have prayer requests, you can put them in the chat on Zoom or on little cards in the pews, and they'll be collected. Uh, we will be having communion today. If you're worshiping at home, you might want to grab a piece of bread, something to drink in a cup, so you can participate virtually. Here, you have choices in the building where if you want to stay in your seat, then you uh, either will have already picked up a little Jesus snack, we call them, or we can bring you one to your pew or you will have the opportunity to come forward later um, for our communion service. So up in our balcony, say hi to Willa and Randy, our tech team. And Lori DePau is our lay reader today. That's wonderful. And John Jurgensen on the organ and piano. And Joyce and Alan are doing ushering and greeting I did have a little possible exposure on Thursday, but I've tested negative Friday, Saturday, and this morning tested, talked to our nurses. They said, don't quarantine, you don't have to quarantine, just wear a mask all the time, which usually I take it off when I'm up here. So can you hear me okay if I really speak out and try to enunciate? If you read lips, that will be a problem. But I did not go anywhere near any of the communion so you don't have to worry about that, although we're all trying to be very careful. And I'm very, very grateful to all the folks who were willing to stand in for me. Lori was going to read my sermon and do the whole service if I had tested positive this morning at 6 o'clock. Uh, but we, there were a group of like eight or nine people who were all ready to do different parts of the two services if I did have to stay home. But... Um, in 39 years, I don't think there's ever been a Sunday I've missed due to illness. Uh, not that I can ever remember. So <laughs> that would have been a first, <laughs> but I'm really glad that I'm here, and uh, so far, so good. And thank you, team. You're a great team. So we are a reconciling congregation. That means that we are working hard within the United Methodist Church to be inclusive to open our doors and our hearts and our, all our ministries to the gifts and graces to all, of all, LGBTQIA, every background, race, if you're here for the first time, if you've been, your family's been in Oneonta for generations and been part of this church for generations, doesn't matter what your immigration status is or, or your gender or gender expression or sexual orientation, you are welcome and our arms are open wide, amen? That's right. And now in the great 50 days, we get to hear about wonderful stories from the New Testament about how people's lives are changed by the presence of the risen Christ. So today we'll hear two really fantastic stories about two apostles, the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. And uh, I'm hoping you'll see yourself in one of these stories at least. But let's begin with a time of silent prayer. So we'll just ask you to sit up straight and tall, put your feet on the floor so you have your shoulders back and lots of room in your lungs. And especially, you know, masks are optional now, but if you are wearing one, it makes it harder to uh, take in deep breaths. But it's a good time to really think about your breath and treasure that the Holy Spirit is entering every cell of your body as you take this time in quiet and contemplation.
If you are able, if it's comfortable for you to do so, we invite you to stand for the call to worship. And your part will be in the dark type. Sing, all people of God. Sing the good news. We cry ourselves to sing. God comes in through the heart. He'll awake us from the joys of grace. Sing in every land and every tongue. Sing the good news. Sing in heaven and on earth. Sing the good news. Broken, hopeless, lost, we cry to God who hears our hearts. Sing, all people of God. We will sing the good news of Easter. Our first hymn is to a tune from Poland. Certainly want to honor our Polish sisters and brothers and siblings who are taking in so many Ukrainian refugees and uh, our hearts go out to them. But this is a tune you probably know more from a Christmas song, but rewritten for uh, Easter. Christ is risen. opening prayer is also responsive. Your part will be the dark type. You take away the drab gray dress of our despair and clothe us with hope and joy. You fill our empty souls with the resurrection feast of peace and life. You are worthy, healing God, and so we worship you. You make us speechless, speechless with your mercy. Yet choose us to tell God's story of new life, 
to all the world. When our secret wounds would sap our energy, you pour your peace into us so that we may be agents of healing. You are worthy, love spirit, and we will praise you. God. peace of Christ be with each one of us. Shall we find safe ways to share the peace with each other and with everyone online? Sorry about that. So in a few minutes, we're going to be hearing a story about going fishing. What? Oh, wow. Look at that. You got two. <laughs> I love it. But in Jesus' time, they didn't use poles. They used nets like this. So, and when they caught all their fish, how many of you like to count? Do you like to count? Are you a good counter? Can you count by tens? They caught so many fish, it almost broke all their nets. So we're going to count, and then you can eat them after a while. Ready? You know, one way, to, one way to count things that have a lot of them is to break them up into tens. I see that they do that when they're counting our offering. They put things like in, order, in groups of ten, and then you can count by ten. Do you know how to count by ten? Okay, ready? Ten... What's after that? 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. 110, 120, 130, 140, 150, but there's only three in this last one, so 153. How about that? That's a lot of fish, right? Look at our fish net. It's so full. Wow. You can have some if you want, if it's okay with your mom. <laughs> so they caught 153 fish. We don't know why they counted them, but they had some. They had a lot of fish, didn't they? It was a lot of fun. So um, we're going to hear that story in just a few minutes. I know you like to count, don't you? So next time you have goldfish at, at home, if you eat that many fish, you probably won't want any dinner, right? <laughs> So let's sing our little children's song, okay. which is called, oh, I just wanted to show you if those 
that many fish were this big instead of that big. Imagine how big they would be, how many fish that would be. Lots of fish, right? All right, we're gonna sing, sing alleluia to the Lord. You can take, you can take those with you if you want. You wanna take the fish with you? song a little bit every week during Easter. Thanks, guys. You were a big help. Oh, thank you. Yay. So now we're going to hear Miss Lori. I'll give her her microphone back and get rid of all these fish. <laughs> Come on, Daniel. Hold on one second. Move some of these things. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs> second and I'll be right with you we good I'm like the cat in the hat I always clean up all my play <laughs> things right okay our first scripture today uh, comes from Acts 9 1 through 6 meanwhile Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, who you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. So our second hymn is You've Come to the Lakeshore, 344. You have a choice to sing in English or in Espanol.
Please remain standing for the gospel if you are able. The gospel comes from John 21, 1 through 19. Jesus appears to seven disciples. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon, Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciples, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It's the Lord! When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there, with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of many large fish, a hundred fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was risen from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Then tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Joyce. So there's these seven guys, three of them are named, Peter, Nathaniel, and Thomas. The other four don't get names, Zebedee's sons, two other guys. Anyway, these seven guys went fishing, fished all night long, didn't catch a thing, not even a nibble. Sounds like the beginning of a corny joke. Next morning, they're calling it a night, bleary-eyed, bedraggled, limping home, tail between their legs. But look, there's someone standing on the beach. 
not a fisherman, from the looks of him. And the stranger says, hey, guys, catch anything? Wise guy, isn't that the way it always happens? You're fishing all night long, about to head home. Some clown thinks it's smart to say, catch anything. A real conversation starter, I'll tell you. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on. I have an idea. Why don't you put your nets down on the other side of the boat? Is this guy for real? No, we, we did that side. We did every side. We did that about a million times already. We've been working all night long. Groan. But just for laughs, they do throw their nets on the other side. And wow, look at all those fish. Grab that net. They're getting away. More, more. Come over here. Hey, who is that guy? I love what happens next when Peter realizes who it is. He stands up in the boat, puts his clothes on, and then jumps in the water. What was that all about? Maybe he wanted to be properly dressed to meet the risen Lord. When they all get to shore and begin to haul in that ginormous catch, they realize what they have on their hands. Unbelievable. They even count them. 153 fish. Can't you see them? Wow, look at this catch. Here, dump them out here. I've got 10 here. How many you've got? 22, 35. Wow, look at that one. Isn't it a beaut? 61, 62, 63, 105, 128, 144. 153 fish. What a breakfast. Boatload of fish. Enough for all. What a catch. Everyone wins. Catch 153. Remember Catch-22, the novel by Joseph Heller? You recall in the book and in the movie, it was set during World War II, Yossarian, the main character, is faced with a no-win situation. Classic. The phrase Catch-22 has entered the language, but there are probably people who, don't, who use the phrase meaning a no-win situation but maybe they don't even know the story. Yossarian is a tail gunner on a bomber plane. More than anything, he wants out of this war. Why? Well, because he might get killed. He says, I've got it. I'll plead insanity. Only there's a catch. Deep within the military rule book is a regulation called Catch-22. It goes like this. The job we are asking you to do is so dangerous that anyone who pleads insanity in order to be excused from service must actually be sane. If you're sane enough to realize how dangerous it is, you must be sane enough to work as a tail gunner. But what if you really are quite mentally unbalanced? According to Catch-22, if you're really insane, you'd never try to get out. Your mind would not be organized enough to read the regulation and seek discharge. That's Catch-22. You can't win. There's no way out. You're stuck. Joseph Heller may have in invented the words, the phrase, Catch-22, but he didn't invent the situation. We've all been there, haven't we? Yes. Here in Oneana and Otsego and Delaware counties, we experienced a kind of a near miss catch 22 with a bewildering spring storm two days after Easter. It actually did snow on Easter, but not during our sunrise service. Hallelujah. Amen. Thanks be to God. Many were, many of you were out of power that Tuesday. No lights, no heat, no internet, no phone, no way out of the cold. Some of some of you for days and days. It was hard. It was unpleasant. People had to throw out the contents of their fridges and freezers right into the trash. But you know, I did not hear one person complain. Why was that? I think it was because of Ukraine. Before the power went off, our TVs and phones were full of truly horrifying Catch-22 images of Mariupol and Bucha and places where civilians, women, children, old people are being shelled 
no water, no food, no shelter, no medical care, truly no win situations. So a few days of shivering for us under blankets and melting snow over a gas stove seemed minor. It was minor compared to what the Ukrainians are going through. People here knew it was weather. It was not a full-blown catch-22. After all, we do have a functioning infrastructure, imperfect as it may be. There isn't some murderous dictator trying to take us out. There were bucket trucks on the way, convoys of them from all over the East Coast, Maine to West Virginia. There were workers with hard hats coming to help, dealing with the dangers of hot power lines lying in the streets, getting us all reconnected. It took time, but it did finally happen. There was no reason to panic. There was certainly no reason to despair. Our hearts do continue to go out, nevertheless, to the many people in situations of genuine Catch-22 across the globe, not only in Ukraine, but also in Palestine, in Syria, in Beijing, Shanghai, wherever people are hopelessly caught in hopeless, no-win situations beyond their control. But getting back to our story from John's Gospel for a few moments, pop quiz. What was the smell that greeted Peter's nose when he was landing his boat coming ashore? What did he smell? Charcoal fire. That's right. And I'm wondering if it brought to mind the last time that he'd seen Jesus. They say our sense of smell is the sense that is most connected to our memory. On a dark night, The week before, Peter had stood in the courtyard of the high priest's house in Jerusalem, warming his hands by the fire. And as he smelled the charcoal burning that bright morning by the sea in the story that we just heard, I wonder if the fragrance of the fire would have brought to mind the young woman who had stopped him that cold night. Aren't you one of this man's disciples? And how he had answered her, I am not. And inside the courthouse, Jesus was being questioned like a common criminal. Outside, Peter stood warming himself by that charcoal fire. Other people standing there asked him again, are you sure you're not one of his disciples? It seems like you have the same kind of accent. I am not, he said. As Peter dug himself deeper into denial with every reply, into betrayal, What he was doing was a catch-22. He was painting himself right into a corner. Will he be able to live with himself, continuing down this particular path? Now the high priest's servants question him. Didn't I see you in the garden with him? And once more, he denies it. I never knew the man. At just that moment, off in the distance, he heard a rooster crow. And at once Peter remembered with great sorrow. The night before, at their last meal together, Jesus had said, truly I tell you, the cock will not crow until you have denied me three times. And he broke down and wept bitterly. So here it is a week or so later, and Peter's standing on the beach on that bright morning next to a net filled to the bursting with fish, 153 of them, I'm wondering if he was wondering, will Jesus receive me now, just as I am? What will he do? What will he say? Is there a way out of this no-win situation? And what did Jesus say? Come and have breakfast! As he took the bread and broke it and gave it to them, no one dared ask, Who is this stranger? They knew it was the Lord. Catch catch 153 wins over catch 22 every time. Amen? Abundant grace, grace upon grace. Enough for everyone and to spare. Happy Easter, everybody. After breakfast, Jesus turned to Peter. Three times he asked him, do you love me? Three times Jesus gave Peter an opportunity to undo what he had done in his threefold denial. 
feed my lambs, tend my flock, feed my sheep. It's as if Jesus was saying, I know what you did was wrong, but my forgiveness is even more real than what you did. I know all about your despair. I knew you blew it, and when, and where. I know. I know all about it, and I forgive you. I still love you. Besides, there's work to be done. So when someone forgives you, sometimes do you have trouble accepting it, accepting that forgiveness? Do you allow Catch-153 to triumph over Catch-22? Can you find the grace to know deep down in your heart that truly loving Jesus means taking real action in the world on the part of the most vulnerable, as we state in our mission? This is the moment when Jesus becomes the rock on which the church was built, when he was able to fully accept God's amazing grace to receive it, to take it into his heart, his soul, into his very being, then he could begin to give that same grace to others to become a real leader in Jesus' new post-Easter resurrection community to proclaim God's love for all. And Jesus, the risen Christ, new life, a fresh start is available to all. And there's a catch. All right. What a catch! It's catch 153, the abundance of life, more than enough for everyone. A new day has dawned, and every morning is Easter morning from now on. Amen.
At this time, we lift up our offering as a response, a joyful, thankful response to the gospel. And I know many of you have found all kinds of creative ways to support our mission and our ministry. The jingle this month of May is for the Jamaica mission team. And we are hoping to have a mission trip one of these years, right? <laughs> we hope. Um, but we will continue to build up our building funds so that we'll be ready whenever the time is right. And uh, thank you for all of you who brought your gifts today or through the mail or uh, by PayPal or Tithely. And some of you found other ways. So, dear Lord, we give you thanks for this catch. Catch 153 and even more. We give you thanks for the abundance of your love and grace giving us more than, giving the whole world, the globe, more than we can ask or even think of in ways of blessing and outpouring of your grace. Bless these gifts. Bless all those who support our mission, our ministries in this city and this county and this state and all around the world. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. should check and see if there's any prayers in the chat. But uh, I, brought, I do have one uh, concern for the family and friends of uh, Brett Miles, um, who passed away from cancer on Friday. He was 50 years old. His parents used to own Pudgy's Pizza. His parents were Ken and Carolyn. Uh, they're now down in the South Carolina area, I believe. So I lift up a Miles family. And each prayer will end in your mercy. We'll pray, hear our prayer. Lord, you call us to be the church, to live out our resurrection faith. We trust you in all things. Your love saves us from despair. You bring the good news of your saving love to others. You raise Jesus to new life. In the same way, you promised to raise our spirits and bring us to new life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. There is a lot we don't understand about you and how you work, just like the disciples in that way. We cannot control our life or understand it completely. The disciples experienced Jesus with them for 50 days. They experienced his power. When he went away, he told them to watch and to wait for that power to return. We give you thanks for the power of the Holy Spirit that helps us to witness to our faith to the ends of the earth as we lift up all those on our prayer list, all those who have been mentioned today, all those who are named in our hearts, especially the Miles family. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Now be with us, Lord. Enlarge our faith. We get too caught up in the troubles of our own lives, the stress. We look for quick and easy answers. Forgive the smallness of our faith. Clear our spirits of the clutter of everyday living. Open us to your word and your love. Challenge us to move in directions of peace and hope for all people. Help us to live out our resurrection faith by serving others. Help us to stay grounded and get moving to serve you in this world. Because that's how we show that we truly love you. We ask all these things in the name of our risen Lord. Amen. So we'll move into the Sacrament of Holy Communion, which is printed in your bulletin and also um, will be on the screen. If you are able, please stand for the great thanksgiving. May the God who turns our mourning into dancing be with you. May God teach you new dance steps as well. May the God who hears our hearts listen to yours. In those depths, we speak for that as we long open grace. May the God who loves us fill you with abundant blessings. We sing glad songs of joy to the one who comes to us. 
You are worthy, God of power and splendor, for you gathered up all the treasures of your imagination, flinging them into that emptiness which would never be again, so that as bees buzzed from flower to flower, as butterflies played chess, chase across meadows, as deer stood as still as silence among the trees, all creation might sing with full voice. When we should have fallen down to worship you with praise-filled hearts, we came blinded by the bright lights of temptation and its companion, death. You cried out to us over and over, offering healing and hope through the prophets, but we hid our faces from them, refusing to listen to your anguished voice. So you sent Jesus to us not to breathe threats against us, but to bring the good news of salvation. With those who weep with the mourning and all those dance in your wonder, we lift up our songs of praise to you this glad day. Holy, 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 holy are you, God, God who restores, restores us to life. life. All, All creation falls down to worship you with praise. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who tells of your faithfulness. Hosanna in the highest. Glory and might are yours, God of holiness. Blessing and honor are the songs we sing to Jesus Christ, the Lamb who died for us. When we were wandering down the crooked paths of seduction, he showed us that street called straight. When we could not make our way through the shadow of sin, we, he took our hand to bring us to you. When the world heaped threats and murder on him, he silently picked up his cross, going to his death, breathing his last, so that resurrection's spirit might fill us with new life in you. As we gather at this table of remembrance, as we celebrate the Feast of Resurrection, we pro proclaim the mystery we know as faith. Christ, Christ died, died to turn death, death into life. Christ, Christ is risen, risen to turn mourning, mourning into laughter. Christ, Christ will come to teach us resurrection's dance. When we're ready to return to our old lives, trying to do the good news our way, you break the bread, you hand it to us, so that as we eat for your life, we may hear your call to feed those who hunger for your justice, your peace, your hope. When we're adrift, getting nowhere, you bless the cup, offering it to us so we might drink of your spirit. We might hear afresh your voice, asking if we love our sisters and brothers, sending us forth to serve them. And when our life has come to an end, when we gather at glory's seashore, feasting on the meal you have prepared, we will not be silent, but praise you forever. God and community, holy and one. Amen. And now as forgiven and reconciled children of God, we pray together, our creator, redeemer, sustainer, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. You may be seated. In the United Methodist Church, we offer an open table. Everyone is welcome to partake. Uh, if you're here for the very first time or if you've never taken communion before in your life, you're welcome. You have two choices. If you want to stay in your seat, um, you may have picked up one of the little kits. We have gluten-free and regular. If you need one now, the ushers will be happy to bring you one if you want to stay in your seat. If you want to come forward, then um, when you come up, you'll take one piece of bread. It's all gluten-free. And then you'll go to one of the five stations along the rail. And there are little sealed cups of grape juice behind the rail. You'll see them. So you may stand or kneel and go ahead and partake as soon as you get there. You may kneel and, or stand and pray as long as you want. The empties go in the purple bowls down below. And um, come for the feast is ready. Amen.
And after supper, Jesus and the disciples went out to the Mount of Olives and sang a hymn. Our hymn is number 581 in the Red Book, or it will be on the screen. Lord, whose love through humble service. Please be seated for a couple of announcements. Thank you, Alan. Right after the service, everyone is welcome to join us for Fellowship Hour. If it's the first time you've been here, maybe. Uh, we haven't had it, really, until just a few weeks ago. You go straight through the room with the couches. That's called the Amberry Room. And you'll go to the left there, and there's coffee, something else to drink, too, probably something snacky, gluten-free stuff, too. So um, just time for conversation if you would like to join us. And you can also, I always bring the uh, virtual coffee hour people in there so you can talk to whoever's joined us online if they stay. Um, I just want to, some of you who've been following this whole slow-moving schism we're going through as a denomination uh, know that today was the day that this um, small conservative group, the globe, which call themselves the Global Methodist Church, are breaking away from us. So I'm going to read you a little um, piece from the Reconciling Ministries Network, and I really en encourage all of you to subscribe to their ongoing blog or whatever it is, 
This is called Myth Busting the Splinter. Ow, we got a splinter. Dear friends, with this weekend comes a day, May 1st, that means simul simultaneously so much and so little in our church. It is true that a splinter group of conservatives is leaving the UMC, preparing as they have been for years to take, it, take with it some of the witnesses and the resource and the kinship of our connection. But it's also true that this schism is merely a formality. The GMC's launch on May 1st marks a small group of conservatives leaving the church. We lament that this splintering has come with misinformation about the United Methodist Church and about LGBTQ plus people and alienation for some United Methodists. In the meantime, know that the Ministry of Reconciliation continues, amen, continues here, amen, for 33 years and counting. In all the forms of Methodism that could stem from the UMC, Reconciling Ministries Network will continue to work for LGBTQ plus justice and inclusion. God's love is boundless, and LGBTQ plus people in any denomination deserve churches and communities where they can be conduits of that love. Amen? With your prayer and support, we will work toward that vision together. And then each time they put out one of these, it's going to be a myth and a fact. So myth busting the splinter. Myth. After its separation from the United Methodist Church, the global Methodist Church will no longer have to contend with LGBTQ plus justice. Fact. LGBTQ plus people will continue to be born into every denomination, every family, and every congregation, thanks be to God. But in a denomination rooted in LGBTQ plus exclusion, as the GMT apparently wants to be, GMC, splintering from the UMC doesn't exclude the existence of LGBTQ plus people or their struggle for dignity. It only isolates them further from care, community, and resources. And that's where we come in to continue to be home for all. Amen? So I know there was a little article in the newspaper, in our local paper, about this yesterday. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't fret too much. God is good, and God's plans will prevail. Amen? That's all I, all I can say about that at the moment. And today we begin our rummage, or it's the United Methodist Women, United Women in Faith's rummage, and uh, I guess everybody can stay and help if they want to, right? Joyce is uh, our amazing logistics person, and you will see this whole building transformed in a few hours uh, to be a place where people can get lots of wonderful things for very little and support the mission of the United Methodist Women slash United Women in Faith. So the actual sale is Thursday 9 to 6 and Friday 9 to 1. Isn't that correct? Books, clothes, housewares, lots of wonderful things. So please come by. And if you want to help, talk here to Joyce Miller. So please receive this blessing unless there's anything else we need to say. Oh, yeah, the resurgence. I was speaking of the wonderful reconciling mission. This is where the... Reconciling Churches are gathering next weekend, if you're not too pooped, from the rummage, Friday night and Saturday in Saratoga Springs. Pick up one of these red folders. If you want to just come up on Saturday, I know some people are doing that. Dana and I are going up Friday night, staying in a hotel. But please pick one of these up. Most of the activities are outside. So if you're worried about the virus, that's a help, I think. So... Um. May the blessing of God creating, redeeming, and sustaining be with you all. Alleluia. Amen. And we do have a, tr and we have a tradition of sitting for the postlude.